All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining this evening. Um, this is our, our third edition of the, the transition from residency to private practice. Uh, again, welcoming uh, Dr. Akadumi and Dr. Deal. Uh, actually, Dr. Deal is actually in California as well this week, so uh, enjoying some sunshine. So we've uh, we've spent the last couple sessions talking a lot about you know the business and that that transition, and we thought maybe tonight we'd end on the episode four. We're going to kind of kick over to a little bit more clinical relevant type information. So. Um, Dr. Akadumi's put together a couple cases to show, and uh, I'm excited to get things going. So uh, I'll just let you take it from there. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Matt, and good to see you and uh, Kyle again, uh, virtually, hopefully soon again in person. <laughs> uh, so today, what we wanted to do a little change, um, kind of show you some cases. Uh, not necessarily talk about all the possibilities or all the cases that we can use by exclude for, but those are the, just some cases and with the time limitations, kind of give you an eye opener and show you what I did is I put a case from residency and case or two from after residency, just to kind of show you the evolution, how I learned and how things change over time. Are we going to see so, the waffle cone today? You will see the waffle cone. Yes, you will. I, got, I have to learn about this <laughs> technique. I have to learn about this. I have to get more cases. I know I post my stuff on Instagram before I write a paper, which is <laughs> dumb. But, <laughs> but but if it ever, if you ever see it, that's my technique. Okay. There's <laughs> a link to you though. That's what matters. Right. <laughs> so so this patient, uh, we did a GBR on the lower left side. And I, was, I, I would love to show you mistakes that I did and how I learned from it. And I'm not going to go too much in details how I usually lecture because this is like a quick, nice chat uh, all of us. Um, so we elevate the flap. We see a slight vertical with horizontal deficiency. Uh, we release the flap. We do our decortications. And I used here some BMP mixed with some aloe and xeno. And a titanium reinforced the perforated PTFE membrane, and I stabilized it. Now, these are residency cases. Now, if I go back, I would want to make sure this membrane is stabilized better, and I don't have room for soft tissue to leak in. In addition to, I did not layer another membrane over this non resorbable membrane. Now, I mean, and after that case, not now, in residency, I learned, no, I need to have an, another layer. And I have been using the, by exclude the amnion chorion for all the good stuff that it has from antibacterial effect, the growth factors that would help with the soft tissue healing. So I want to have that buffer to help me. Now, generally speaking, this is a perfect closure because you can see with my first layer of suture of horizontal mattress, it's almost edge to edge, so it's tension free. But you can see it's a very thin lingual flap that you can see the titanium from underneath it. So we did well for five weeks, and then we get one dehiscence. If you have not got that yet, this means you need to work more. You will get <laughs> exposures, you will get dehiscences no matter what. Whoever says they don't have it, they have not worked enough or they're lying. So eight weeks, we get the exposure, and I tried to be in the brains. Uh, at that time, I was um, making sure that I see the patient every week. And at three months, 12 weeks follow-up, that's when it gave up, and I started seeing suppuration, and I decided to open it up. I felt a little bit more comfortable at three months to open it up. And I can see some bone. I didn't want to granulate that. Just left it as is. Left all the granul the granulation tissue on it. Just cleaned it up. And I used by exclude. And I got the largest size available. And I had it lay over the uh, grafting that was done before. And I had it extended to the lingual where that dehiscence was. So I left it exposed. Now, trying to suture that is going to be a pain in the neck. It's not going to be easy. The lingual side of the mandible uh, on a patient who was in pain and not happy about the dehiscence because, you know, we're always to be blamed. Um, 
So I left the bio exclude exposed over there and patient comes back in one week, which is seven days. And that's what we see. So it closed up completely. I'm very, very, very happy seeing that. No epithelium moves 0.5 millimeter a day. I don't think if I let only normal healing to take in, it's gonna look like that at one week. So it helped close it up quickly in addition to less foot trapment and hopefully better bone quality underneath. And that's what we see later. I waited another two, three months and then we go back in, beautiful bone. We place the implants where they need to be. We close back and then we come back to do our soft tissue grafting. So this is a residency case. The take from it is to learn um, from your mistakes. Do mistakes, that's normal. That's how you improve, that's how you get better. And um, the fact that I've used for a wound dehiscence, the by exclude, helped me get where I got with the healing and expedite the healing process. Now, would it make a big difference? This is what we always argue. Maybe yes, maybe not. But if I can close a hole quicker than what it would usually take, I'll take that. I'll tell you what too, those lingual holes, are tough mm -hmm. uh, and and sometimes you know we get to a point i think one of the nicer things that can happen from that is the the quick soft tissue closure because you get to a point with that and you've probably seen this in more people who have lingual tori and things where it doesn't close then until some of the necrosed bone sloughs off exactly and that can be painful and that can take weeks and and you really don't have a, a great course on telling your patients how to deal with that other than, you know, we'll try to keep it clean and when it sloughs off and sloughs off. So by getting that soft tissue closure, especially in an area that doesn't heal well anyway, man, I, I would, there's no reason not to, not to be able to give it whatever you can. Right. In addition to this is a GBR site. It's not a site that I did an extraction and there's a little bone that I'm just telling the patient to baby it, right? This is a site that I'm concerned. I want to make sure whatever I have and the bone that I have, if it's still immature, I want that bone to mature over time and to stay there for me to be able to do my procedure. Because the last thing I want to do is redo that GBR. Um, and definitely we, we got where we need to be. But nowadays I'm layering a second layer of membrane on top of an unresorbable membrane. Uh, whatever you like using, if you like to use collagen membrane, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But if I'm using something, I want something that has the growth factors and the biologics and the antibacterial properties to help with the soft tissue healing, to help me expedite the process. Um, and that's where where I, I like to use BioExclude in, in one of those GBR cases. You know, another thing that I think is important with that, and this is a, an interesting topic. So whenever we're talking about some of these membranes, whether they're going to be a 3D printed uh, titanium mesh or something with, you know, a PTFE, it, you know, we were thinking for a long time, let's leave that in six months. And then, uh, you know, there's been some really nice presentations recently, Picos, Urban, and they're saying, no, that interaction that we want to exclude in the very beginning with soft tissue and hard tissue, is very good for the overall development of that bone. So, you know, we talk about some of these mistakes and learning from them, but also just like good science, the best mistakes or the best way of going forward is sometimes from things that didn't go excellent. And I think you might have gotten a really, really good result with your bone by only having that membrane in for eight weeks versus mm -hmm. trying to keep it in six months and then having to develop the bone. And then this is, everyone gets into these conversations and I think people really need to pay attention to really what conversation they're having, but how long do membranes stick around? Mm -hmm. What they're doing, right? And once we have a, a stabilization and healing, why do you want it there longer? When people are like, oh, I really want my, my resorbable membrane for six months. I'm like, why? What do you- Yeah, what's the point? Yeah, well, why? Why is that your necessity? 
So I think here too, if we're hoping to have some sort of development of the soft tissue and hard tissue, having bioexclude there, you've got some quicker healing and close everything, make sure that you're not ending up with an infection that ruins the work you did. But then, you know, to have that go away and then allow for just natural development of the site, both hard and soft tissue, that's awesome. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that was a great case you were able to save that. That's awesome. Yep. So this was uh, the first one. Now we're going to jump into sinus, but not into the waffle cone technique yet. <laughs> now I can tell you, boy exclude in the sinus has been beautiful. I've got tons of cases where I've used it, and it's, it's just so nice. The fact that it comes dry and do not wet it until it touches the sinus. And it just works perfectly great. It sucks up on the sinus for perforations. It's just amazing. So as you see here, got a, a large mucus retention cyst. Now, if it was a small one, we can do the lift, no issue. But I'm lifting another 10 to 12 or maybe 15 millimeter. We might close the ostium, so better remove it. So we, um, we, I do my planning. I drew where I expect the vessel to be. I drew where I want the window and where my implants would need to go. And we do the osteotomy. Now, could you not, I was trying really hard to perforate this membrane. And this is the first time ever I'm doing a sinus augmentation and aiming to perforate the membrane. I'm always aiming not to perforate it. This one, I wanted to perforate it to remove the mucus retention cyst. It was pain in the neck to do so. So here's a perforation. Look how big it is. And this post got deleted out of Instagram. I had to repost it because of um, violence and sexual parts and whatever, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just because of this pic picture. Um, uh, they've, they've got issues on Instagram. But anyways, <laughs> you can see <laughs> where I created the... Big Thayer froze a little bit yeah, there. Yeah, awesome. We lost him. We'll see if he if he can hear us. But I, I've I've actually seen him him talk about this case a little bit. So this, this is a good one. You know, and and this gets into there's there's been some really nice uh, talks osteogenics this last year. And some people were were actually finally having the good conversations between periodontics, oral surgery, and and ENT. And when it's necessary to remove these, who's best to remove them, et cetera. And I think that, that brought up, you know, that's a really good point is we don't really worry too much about it until we have concern about it blocking the osteum, mm -hmm. right? And at what point? And, and I think that's why when Thayer was getting into that, the volume he was going to need to get the implant bone, uh, you know, 12, 14 more millimeters. That's when he had to make that decision to go after it versus, and like he was saying, sometimes I see those mucus retentiousness or just even a little bit of inflammation in the, the bottom of those uh, sinuses. And it's like, great, this is my, this is my time to use, you know, various techniques, Versa, et cetera, because Sorry. you're going to bounce All right. off. All right. We got you back. Can you hear me? We got you now. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here. Here. Looks like looks like I got a cold spectrum and have them pay me back whatever I paid for the new internet that I just <laughs> had them installed this week. I'm glad that I'm testing this out. So <laughs> all right. I think I made you a co-host again, so you should be able to jump back in there. I'm sorry. No, you you're good. Start recording Hey, but we went, we would, we spent a little time there. We just went back over some reasons why we're looking at, you know, preserving the ostium, why you removed it versus leaving it. Sometimes where thickening of the sinus membrane can be a huge benefit if we can do a, a sinus, you know, vertical uh, lift versus a, a lateral window. So I think we're, we're at that yeah. point. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we're back good. I can yeah. continue. 
So I was I was talking about how we check for perforations by asking the patient to breathe in and out. And here's my patient breathing in and out. So here I asked the patient to take a deep breath. She was asleep. She was trying to wake up. Now she does. And now she's trying to breathe. It's flying. It goes up and down. Good. I have no perforation then. We're all good. So you can see a one centimeter almost in diameter a perforation. And still the sinus membrane goes up and down. So using that maneuver, Michael Picos always talks about this. It's not something that you can predictably use to tell if you have a perforation or not. So we, we go in and then I decided to suture the membrane. So I sutured the sinus membrane together to repair the perf. And then I get my baby membrane. Got the bike glued in and it goes in nicely and smoothly. And I made sure that it goes all the way to the medial wall. And then get the implant in at the same time. I was able to place one, but the second one was not stable. So it was too risky. I took it out. So we graft and we lay another bi exclude membrane over the bone graft and we switch it back and we close. So this is also from private practice now, being out after residency. I still use it, I still love it. It's still making my life easy and giving me nice soft tissue healing and doing the job that I need to get done. Any comments, uh, Dr. Deal or Matt? No, I mean, that's that's a, a great use. I think you're absolutely right. And, and even in people who have their favorite membranes for things, one of the biggest things that I've heard is everyone keeps bioexclude around for these cases, right? Mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. And then I think from there, you touched on this and you actually mentioned it in the first podcast, and I think it's always worth circling back to, is everyone should spend a little time messing with the membranes and mm -hmm. how to use them. And you said this when you first were using BioExclude, it was very frustrating. And you have to pay attention to your techniques because they can fold on each other. All of the, once you know how to use it, all of the reasons why it's great are also the reasons why it's super frustrating in the beginning. You know, mm -hmm. get into the positions you want. You, you don't, like, this is a perfect example right away after, you know, with your PTFE, you get your nice uh, three to four millimeter pocket that you can tuck it into. And, and that's not exactly, it's not how you would do or use a bio exclude over in this case. So exactly. You have it in your office for uh, sinus, you know, break it out for a few other things and, and start to mess with it. See how best it can work for you in a couple other situations. Cause uh, you will be able to use it in a lot more and, and a lot more ideal aspects when you can pay attention to its proper technique and use. Uh oh, did, did the did the spectrum go out you lose, again? You lose him again. <laughs> oh no. But um, no, I think that is is perfect while we're waiting if, if we lose him one more time matt we i, I was telling him poor guy he's, he's selling his house he's he's uh I know. he's flying out to spain for us yes. and then uh he and i both have our board exams on uh not not three days from now monday but 10 days from now monday so really? told, yeah we have our oral board exam so I got you back. Worst comes to worst. We'll, uh, we'll, I'm we'll back. Can you hear me? Forward. We got you. <laughs> Man. Okay. I think I got to sit next to the router and the Wi-Fi. <laughs> you're going to be, I will, you're gonna be sitting on the bathroom toilet here in a minute, buddy. <laughs> and, and I will sue Spectrum later on. <laughs> 
Sorry, I had to disappear for a second. My uh, my five year old's looking for for paper. Um, I assume he's going to make some drawings. <laughs> Let's see now. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sure the residents will be entertained in in this episode. They will see how hard we were trying to make this work. Well, all of these yeah. residents had some had some COVID years, right? So they've they're they're probably accustomed to the Zoom uh, snafus and humor. Yep, yep. So let's see. Let's share it. Yeah, at least I count on I, Matt's I, edit editing skills. <laughs> we'll see how good they are. I told my wife at least this episode is going to be the only one that my kids are not going to show up in the in the camera. <laughs> so. But now I've got other stuff going on. So yeah, so we were saying, I mean, definitely it's 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 a learning curve. Residents, they need to try everything out there. I'm not promoting only trying by exclude. No, I'm I'm telling you, try everything out there. See what works in your hands. There there might be something that and don't give up. If you try it once and it doesn't work nicely, that doesn't mean it's not good. It means there's a learning curve. I told you the first time I tried to buy exclude, man, if I knew Matt at that time, I would have <laughs> yelled at his face. It was horrible. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to handle it. I was I was so frustrated. But over time, you start learning and you start seeing techniques and seeing other people, how they use it. You start building knowledge on how it's done. That doesn't mean it's not good. It just means you need to learn how to use it. So uh, let me kick into the next one. So this is where I kind of come up with the waffle cone technique. I love the sinuses a lot. And my master research in residency was on crestal sinus elevation. I hopefully soon I can send it for publishing when life is not crazy. And we can talk about that in another episode. Uh, but yeah, first year after graduation, life is going to be super crazy. We're taking our board exam next week and... Uh, <laughs> don't let me start anyway <laughs> so so i was looking at the incidence of sinus membrane perforation with crystal sinus elevation whether we use osteotome or versa the data we have out there is not 100 percent accurate and it's not true because we cannot detect the perforation really good now the with the the beauty of versa drills that the way they drill and shape the bone and push it towards the osteotomy and towards the apical part, when you're drilling and you look inside, most of the time I'm able to see the sinus membrane cl clearly. And I do that when I get up to the four millimeter drill. So most of the time I'm able to see if I've perfed or not. With the osteotomes, I did not have that luxury much because that bone was still attached to the membrane. Um, so in this case, we take out the tooth, we graft it, we allow it to heal. We come back later to do the implant and the sinus augmentation. We do the drilling, we do the osteotomy and we look at the osteotomy and I want the residents to look at two pictures. Look at this one where you see the perforation right here and the perforation right here is smaller than what it started. Because when it happened, I got some of my um, sinus curettes inside the osteotomy. And I did kind of like the Yamada technique. And I tried to lift up the sinus from the inside. Okay. And look at the CBCT and look at the periapical x-ray. If you show this CBCT to anyone, I did a poll on my Instagram. 85% thought that there's no perforation. This is looking perfect. The 15%, most of them were my cousins who are not even dentists, and they just voted that there is a perforation. So you can't tell that there is a perforation. You look at this x-ray, there's a nice dome. Everything is looking nice. But the reality is we have a perforation. Now, how significant that is, that's a different topic. But when we talk about incidence of the perforation is higher than what we expect. Now, how do we manage? So the first thing I did over here with my curettes, I tried to lift up the sinus from the inside. 
by doing so, when you have a big hole, you try to lift it up. As you lift it, the perforation will shrink a little bit and get smaller. Then I come up with my ice cream cone technique. Uh, the waffle cone, I'm sorry, waffle cone technique, which we can say this came up from Cold Stone uh, ice cream. Uh, and I like the uh, Oreo double fudge, whatever that thing is, where you have the waffle cone coming out of the cup and you have the scoops of the ice cream in the inside. So I decided what membrane is nice, dry, antibacterial and smooth and has growth factors that will help me with the sinus membrane healing. The amnion chorion by exclude. So I wanted that and I got the large, a uh, really large size of the membrane and I tuck it inside the osteotomy with the osteotome, just think there's just finger pressure and place the bone graft on top of it. Allow the edges of the membrane to stay on the crest and gently start protruding that bone graft and carry the membrane with it. So it's gonna go in as one piece. So bone graft is contained in the bio exclude and they both go in and I'm still seeing the edges of my bio exclude over the crest of the osteotomy. So I know that the bone graft is not getting dispensed everywhere where that perforation was. And then I get my implant in. Very slow speed, very gentle, go in, stop, go in, stop, go in, stop. Let it push it slowly and gently and surely to make sure it stays contained. And this is where we end up. So I've used it for a couple of cases. It's working nicely. It's, it's looking great so far. Uh, but this is one way of trying to manage a perforation. It's not a problem for a perforation to happen. It's just how do we manage it? Because it's going to happen whether you like it or not. We um, just got to trademark now, the waffle cone technique now, right? We just got to. I know, it. right? <laughs> now, some of the questions that I got on Instagram, and I'm sure the residents would ask, why didn't you just place the implant, no bone graft? That would have been an option. But the osteotomy, most of the buccal wall was bone and I had a slope towards the lingual. So most of my sinus was on the lingual side. So if I inserted my implant, most probably, even if I used an eight millimeter, most probably four or five millimeter of that implant would have been in the sinus. And that's too much. I can allow two to three millimeter into the sinus and research showed us that it may heal with no issues, but four to five millimeter, no, that's a lot. And it's over a slope, then no, I'm trying to graft it. Or the other option would be do a lateral window, lift the sinus, repair it, place a bone graft, place the implant at the same time. But this is a way that didn't I didn't need to do a lateral window. And look, I have a vessel over here. So we have vital structures. We have risk of bleeding. We have a patient who walked in for a 20 minutes procedure. Now it's an hour, hour, 15 minutes. So we, we, we can manipulate it in a way to try to avoid going into all of these um, surgeries and be uh, less invasive. I love it. This is a great case. Yeah, I'll make one other point here too, because this is something I really like. And I think hopefully people's programs will allow them to do this, but definitely do it uh, when you can, when you get out. Because now CBCTs, the the amount of exposure they have is, is so far reduced especially if you can do localized um you know there's there's mm -hmm. best evidence now that patients don't even need to wear lead vests um and my point with this is i really like that they took that cbct because from a two-dimensional aspect you can tell yourself a lot of lies uh mm -hmm. but you know as we start to see things three-dimensionally uh you'll find out a lot more about your placement, about what you're seeing clinically and feeling clinically and how that relates to things. Uh, you muted yourself. You Bye. muted yourself there at the end. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was saying it, it just has a, a great uh, ability to, to, like you were just saying, learn from all the aspects that you can and all the angles that you can, right? Yep.
and 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 definitely this is this is one of my let's say my my passion that's why i did my research on it we cut the cadaver heads right here to expose the sinus cavity so i had a direct visual um video recording and visual inspection of how the sinus perforates when we're doing crystal sinus elevation. You will be amazed by how it perforates. You will be amazed when it does perforate. Most of it, not when we drill. Most of it is when we're placing the implant. And no matter what implant system you use, there is a limit for that sinus membrane and it's gonna perforate. And when that happens, we're not seeing it. Mm -hmm. We take x-rays and those x-rays 60% of the time they're accurate. We've done also a study at Loma Linda, 60 to 63% accuracy is for the CBCT. If we take just this case, accuracy is 0%. Because CBCT is going to say no perforation. Clinically, we have a perforation. So this is, this is one of the things that we need to kind of look at and know. If you're in doubt, my advice, either if you have enough bone, and the sinus is okay, you don't have a slope, and you think you can get the implant and just two millimeters on the sinus, you can place it without a bone graft. But if your case is not, and it's like my case, then I feel comfortable using this technique um, to try to contain uh, to contain the bone graft. No, I, I love it. And thank you for sharing. Um, there was a lot of questions around the office this week about what the waffle cone technique was since you posted <laughs> it. So I'm glad I'll be able to go back and, and share with everyone what it is. But yeah, and thank you again for sharing, you know, a case in residency, some cases after residency. I think that's that's awesome just for you to be able to show, you know, just kind of, you know, the transition, the learning, uh, the mistakes and, and the outcomes. And uh, uh, actually, you know what? I think I got one more. You have a minute? Yeah, let's let's do it. Okay. So another sinus. Now you here, what, I was hoping when I saw this, I was like, "Oh, are we gonna see a root amp here? Did you do a lateral <laughs> lateral window root amp?" But no, no. But this one, this one is how our surgeries are never black and white. Okay, there's always the gray. So patient comes for extraction, cracked tooth. Everybody looks at this picture. They look at the x-ray. They're like, ah, try to do a root canal. Looks like a good tooth. Then, oops, there's a crack going all the way mesial to distal. So I talked to the patient about the extraction. And um, we did the extraction. After I cleaned everything, I look and I see there is no sinus floor. I'm looking at the sinus membrane. So there is no perforation. So I told the patient, you know what? You need a sinus lift. Do you want me to do it now? He goes, yeah, get it done. So now considering all what was there, the periapical legion, all the gunk, uh, seeing the sinus membrane. Now, clinically, I couldn't see any perforation, but I did my lift through the crest with my sinus curettes. So I get my bioexclude. I keep it dry and I tweak it and tuck it inside and I let it suck into the sinus membrane. So this picture right here on this corner is showing you the mem the sinus membrane and above it there is the bioexclude. Then comes my xenograft that I had it as one piece to help me also reduce the chance of particles moving around and then allograft on top of it, and then we suture back again. So th also, again, another use. I was not planning to do the sinus at the same time of the extraction. Things work out this way. Why not? We'll get it done, and we, we can predictably, uh, we have the tools and everything is needed um, to do so. This is also another video. I mean, I've got tons of slides, but I've been trying to cut off. So I don't bore you guys with these. Uh, this is kind of show you um, how I place the by exclude. So if you have a little bit larger window, that would be better so you can squeeze it in easily. You can just ex 
right tuck it right in uh, but if it's a little bit smaller window then you will need another instrument to help you uh, tuck it in so you can use a caret you can use whatever you like to use to get the uh, by exclude in and that's right after you finish lifting the sinus from the uh, lateral wall to the media wall and um, you can wet at the end the instrument you see I brought another instruments and I wet the side so it doesn't stick to the membrane and it helps me push the membrane up and that's it now we got the membrane where it needs to be and now we just get our bone graft and we're good to go this is kind of like a visual i, I like to show it to you not necessarily show you the whole case but uh, no, that's, visual a great, off. that's a great video that's a great video mm -hmm. no that's that's good and i, I think that's another thing is with a lot of these cases and in, in all residents figure this out and you definitely have the days and you figure it out in private practice but you need to be prepared for all things that that can come you know sometimes you have the benefit of getting to be able to do some extra like that sinus at the same time but other times you are it's a necessity and so making sure that you have the right materials and making sure that you're kind of mentally prepared with your team to pivot is that's yep. a, good, a good reminder right there Mm -hmm. definitely and and when you get out when you get outside make sure you you have enough and if you love something make sure you have enough of it because i love this freaking membrane and sometimes i come to the point that i need my baby membrane and they're like doc you just use the last one <laughs> this morning i was like ah you just should have told me or ordered earlier <laughs> so make sure your staff staff are on top of it uh, if you use it a lot, so this way you don't get into the point that you need it and you're not able to use it. Because residency we were spoiled. Everything was out there. <laughs> I can lick a by exclude membrane and not happy with it. I can put on the side, lick another by exclude membrane, put on the side, and then bring another three by exclude membrane, and I'm still good. But in private practice, you, <laughs> you, you, you can't lose any. You have one, you use it. The next one and as we go 100 percent. yeah well dr akademi thank you so much for showing your cases tonight i know dr deal you're on you're on point for next session to show some show and highlight some of your cases so i'm looking forward to that oh, and absolutely. um for all the residents out there you know thank you again for tuning in hopefully uh you liked us mixing it up and doing something clinical this evening uh, episode four will be clinical as well. Um, you know, we're, we're in a roughly 50 plus percent of the residency programs. Um, so if your residency is not one of those, you know, by all means, please reach out to me. Uh, would love to connect and, um, you know, at least have you get the exposure while you're in school and, uh, who knows, maybe you'll be, uh, maybe you'll be on these podcasts in the future, right? Yep. Absolutely. And that brings up a good point, too, uh, to all the residents out there. You know, we're the ones that are, are really into and, and on Instagram or, or having the time to look at new things that we want to trial. And there's no better time than during the residency. So, you know, reach out. I know that we did. And, and luckily, we had the faculty that allowed us to kind of pursue things and, and make connections. But if you have that at your residency, make sure you're doing it. You know, try membranes, try materials, try bone, try equipment, um, you know, and also see what you can get out to as far as experience, because there's also, you know, through CE events or things like that, there's a lot of companies that will help uh, either sponsor your participation as long as you can get there and things like that. So, you know, our residencies all offer us a lot of things, but, uh, you know, we're the ones who have that interest level right now. We're the ones who are absorbing and learning new things and wanting to trial things uh whereas sometimes you know people in our residency faculty or like we're talking about with private practice we're all going to get into our you know it's going to get more and more narrow and we're going to find our happy zone and, and now's your chance so so just like you said Matt, reach out there's no problem with reaching out no one's going to get mad about it uh and you know get this stuff in your hands and 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 we're at the best time with 
social media and webinars and people reaching out easier than what it was before. Um, so definitely, as 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 Dr. Deal mentioned, you're at a time where you have all the opportunities right in front of your eyes. You just need to go and grab it and keep going and work on it. I know a lot of residents, they're performing just absolutely amazing. And I'm seeing their cases on social media and I'm blown by their their level in residency. And as I told you, I think social media has really, really uh, affected everyone, hopefully in a positive way. Definitely makes you step up your game if you're about to uh, <laughs> put something out to everybody, right? Oh, yeah. And, and guess what? <laughs> Now, now I'm verified. So now you can trust my judgments. Now, <laughs> now you're paying your you're paying your eight bucks a month. No, fourteen ninety nine. Come on, oh. bro. <laughs> inflation, inflation, right, inflation. inflation. All right. Yeah, well, now, thank you now. again. <laughs> thank you again, everyone, for tuning in, and, and have a great evening. You're welcome. Thank you.